A passing carriage is shot by an arrow from nowhere visible to them, and then a voice from the carriage asks if it was an attack on them. Still, another voice says it was just one arrow. Just then, they notice that the carriage stops. They start thinking and talking about what they are going to do. A guy on a horse shows up and tells them they couldn't move again because the horses are gone, with a big smile showing up in his face. A guy was seen waking up with someone so tall standing before him who started to call his name repeatedly. Pat sounded surprised that he was still alive. The guy waking up then asked who Pat was as he was thinking and wondering how he was Pat when he knew himself to know him Jin. And at that moment, he woke up, the back of his head started to hurt, and his fellow recruits were screaming at him. Then, replying to the person talking to him in a bid to confirm to the person in front of him that he is very much indeed alive, he calls him Wayne. Wayne then told him that he should come up and help him since he was alive. Then Pat saw that they were fighting against some extremely big and very tall giants. The giants were busy smashing heads and inflicting injuries on them as they continued to fight it. Then he stood up, realized they were fighting against orcs, and decided to join the fight. Suddenly, the orc king appeared, and the archers almost immediately started firing their arrows at him, but they found out then and there that it was useless against the orc, as he was very tough in the skin. The flight soldiers were trying to do anything they could to stop the invasion, and also, at the same time, trying to treat the wound wounded survivors. At that moment, Paths decided to attack the orc and hit the orc on his Achilles tendon, which caused a cut and bleeding to the orc's leg. This made the orc very angry, and then he decided to face them while Pat tried to run away with the hope that he could at least divert the orc's attention. Then, as he was running away from the orc, he seemed to notice that the ox's movement was getting slower, so he told everybody to aim for the orc's eyes. They could aim for its eyes and pierced the orc's eyes with their sharp spears. Pat was seen on a bed, slowly waking up from sleep again, and asked, where he was then. Wayne, his friend and co-soldier, told him it was a camp for injured soldiers and asked him how he was and that it was good to see him awake. But Part told him that his abdomen hurt him so much. Wayne then told him he was very lucky not to have died as the orc had hit him with a piece of wood. And then Pat asked Wayne about the orc. Wayne told him once they had stuck their spears into his eyes, they all speared him to death, and Pat said he must have gotten all the credits for that. But Wayne said if it wasn't for the past, he would not have been able to reach the orc. But Pat said he got struck and passed out, so he didn't deserve to take any credit. Then, he said that he he was impressed that he was able to get to the orc's back, and Pat said it was because he had a weak presence, and his friend attested to that, and he said it was always difficult to know where he was. His friend laughed and told him there was going to tell the captain that he had woken up. What had happened was that a battalion of the kingdom's army was ordered to attack, and thankfully, they were able to kill or wound the orc as they had already killed the orc king, and no citizens were harmed or injured. Pat introduced himself as Patrick Rigbsey from the Detroit zone of a baronial family of the western frontier of the mental kingdom. He was 15 years old and considered an adult in this world, and then he joined the royal army when he came of age. He couldn't remember why he joined the army, and he couldn't remember anything about the Japanese either. Just then, Wayne got to the caption and told him Pat was already awake. The king thanked him and told him to leave. The captain said he wasn't expecting Pat as a young soldier to be so good and wondered how I had managed to take down the orc king. One of the officers around him asked him about Pat's reward, and he was told to give Pat three gold coins and a promotion to a sergeant rank, as well as two gold coins for Wayne and ten silver coins for the others. Pat opened his bag of gifts he had just gotten and found three gold coins, and he started to dance. At that moment, Wayne came in and asked why he was dancing. He then told Wayne about the three gold coins reward he had just gotten, and he asked for Wayne's reward too, and Wayne said that he also got two gold coins. Pat was dancing because of the Japanese yen, which was 300 million yen in Japanese yen. Thinking of what to do with their reward money, they went to the weapon shop to get more weapons. Upon arriving at the store, they found out that spears were surprisingly expensive, and then they figured out why they handed used space to a new recruit. Teddy said, Monsters must be fought from a distance, and spears are the primary weapon. They are not cheap, but weapons that destroy well are of priority over money. Wayne said he would like to buy a sturdy spear with the right amount of weight, and he was given an iron spear and was told it wasn't heavy. He handled it too and realized that it wasn't heavy. And then he was told that the price of the iron spear was two gold coins. And he tried to bargain and was able to do so to one gold coin and 70 silver coins. Pet wanted something lightweight and sharp. He was then given a spear with a short handle and a sharp and long blade and a normal length spear with a short blade. But he decided to go for the sharp and short hand as it helped him reach the enemy better from behind. And he got that for one gold coin and he bought it. In their world, there was no electricity and alternative sources like coal and wood were also expensive. So each man had to leave his home early in the morning, and their breakfast consisted of black hard bread, bean soup, and fried bacon. Then the soldiers of the royal army began their work of protecting the royal capital against the so-called monsters around the capital. Also, adventurers exist in this same world, and they either hunt down demons 
or farm medicinal herbs. Demon hunters like goblin exterminators were walking and discussing as they were keeping a check for goblins. Wayne warned them that they had to be careful as goblins walk in packs and might be waiting for them. Pat had become a platoon captain, and he said he had a feeling that the orcs were still out there. He urged them to continue walking deeper, and suddenly, after walking a while, he told them to stop as it felt like he had sensed something. Then he distributed the soldiers to different angles, according to their squad, Sergeant Wayne's, Captain Tony's, and Corporal Meerkock's squad, and they all moved out. Suddenly, they saw a set of goblins feasting on a bull, and the archer got set and fired their arrows at the goblins together. They were ordered to fire their second shot when ready again to fight against the goblins, warning them to stay alert. Wayne told them to cut off the goblins' heads as they turned into zombies if they were left to die and to secure the nose as proof that they had different and longer noses. Suddenly, they were interpreted by the appearance of trolls. Surprised, Wayne and Pat wondered what the trolls were doing there then, and they ordered their soldier to continue shooting their arrows at the troll at will. At the same time, the two of them moved closer to attack the troll, trying all angles to hit the troll. And after so many attacks and fighting with the troll, who seemed pretty strong too, they ended up killing the troll as huge as it was. Pet told the soldiers to cut off the troll's head and check on all of their soldiers to see if anyone got hurt. But thankfully, no one got hurt, and there were just minor scratches, so they left. They got back home and gave their reports to the colonel, who said he would check the rest of the trolls by himself after Pat told him it looked like the trolls were still out there. On their way out, Pat said he would have loved the colonel to investigate by himself as they were not sure how many trolls were left, so they decided to send a team that the captain would pick, and then Pat proposed they went to sleep. A while later, there was an uproar in the Soilders' camp, and a stretcher alongside towels and water was being requested. What's going on? Pat asked, and he was told that it was a staff sergeant, and that it was the subjugation troop for the first trolls. The group defeated and came back with the corpses of two trolls, and out of 15 men, three had died. Pat thought to himself that it was irresponsible to send out a troop to fight trolls at night, as it was a suicide mission, and yet they still did that. A second lieutenant named Scott Paginot had ordered them out to fight. He thought that since he was able to kill two trolls in one night, seeing how difficult it was, with their head being brought along, he would be promoted to lieutenant as he was being summoned for an explanation. He was asked why he ordered his troops to fight, but instead, he boasted of being the only one to come back with the least casualties for an operation that brought back immediate results. He was then reminded that his mission was to investigate the trolls, but he operated based on his judgment and had three of his men killed, not to mention how dangerous it was to fight trolls at night, and he could still talk about being leased. The following day after the troll fight, Pat was promoted to lieutenant rank and rewarded with five gold coins. In comparison, his friend Wayne got promoted to sergeant and was rewarded with three gold coins, while Scott Paginu was instead demoted to the rank of corporal, and then things changed in the hierarchy. A month after the troll's extermination, the colonel sent two messengers to call Pat and say he wanted to speak with him. Then, after the meeting, he assembled his troop and told them that the colonel had ordered and that they were going to clear the main road as the crown prince would come to inspect in 10 days, and they must eliminate every obstacle they faced until then, and he also added that commissioned officers would join them. Pat then asked for Wayne's idea, as they could easily prevent the monsters, but the problem was the bandits. Wayne then told him that since he had disguised himself like a noble carriage to check around recently and didn't get attacked, it probably meant no bandits were around. Pat then said if that was so, they could continue with their plans. The next day, they would prepare. The next day, the soldiers were all riding in wagons and patrolling, and unknowingly to them, there were troops of bandits waiting in ambush and ready to attack them. Then, the bandits had calculated that each carriage would carry just four men, and they had calculated all their luggage and expensive goods. As soon as the soilders got close, they were ambushed and attacked, and the fight began. The bandits thought they would win, and suddenly, more soilders came out as it was part of their plans to let them dominate, so they would counterattack them as there were more men in the wagons, and so the bandits called a retreat. At that moment, Pat attacked their leader and cut off his head. According to the report, they killed 51 bandits and captured captured one while they lost two, and three were injured. They were asked who was injured and killed, and they were being treated, but the commander told him to take a horse carriage and bring the two killed and the three injured back to the capital. He also asked that they interrogate the captured man and look for the bandit's lair too, to see if they had one or not. Wayne called Pat and told him not to look so gloomy for losing just two men, but Pet felt he could have done more if he was stronger, and that he felt for their families too. Then, a report came to Pat that the captured refused to talk after being interrogated. Paginu came to Pat and asked him if they had found the bandit's hideout yet, but he was told the platoon leader was investigating him already. The bandit didn't talk, so he was beaten near death and left to recover again and beaten till he was ready to spill. A while later, Pat came out and told the others that the bandit had spilled their hideout, and they wondered what he did to get the words out of the bandit's mouth. When they got in there, the bandit had loads of dislocated bones, and then Paginu came to him and told him it was too much what he did, and it was small compared to what he would normally do. He was asked if he didn't feel anything after that, but he said after all he was a bandit and that they would end up 
killing him regardless. On getting to the bandit's hideout, which was a cave, Hat said his troop and Wayne's troop would go inside, and the rest would split to scan the surroundings for any living creatures. On getting in, they saw the bandit's food depot and their armory and their spoils too. On getting close, they discovered there were three people in a cage. They asked who they were, and Pat introduced himself to them as the lieutenant of the kingdom's first army and said they were there to protect them. The man said he was relieved, as he thought they were just adventurers, and he introduced himself as Carlos and their escort mark. He introduced the last person as the third son of Marky Kevin Dixon. Then Pat told them to move back as he was going to break the iron bars, which he did. Carlos appreciated him and said they would never forget his favors, Pat. Pat told them that he was just doing his duties, but Carlos said they would tell his master about Pat. Then the man asked about his family, and Pat said he was Rigsby's third son. They appreciated him, and he insisted that he only did his job. Dixon then said he would also like to appreciate him, and would be sad if he didn't accept their gratitude. He asked if Pat was the captain, and he said he was. The boy said it was admirable that he was the captain that young, and he would even appreciate him more. But Pat insisted they talked about the matter later, and that they should be headed to the road, as they would give them a ride back home. As they were heading home, Pat asked for reports and was told there was a large-scale unit ahead of them. Pat asked if they were bandits, but he was called to see their flag, and he told them that regardless, they needed to wait for orders and stand by as they raised their flag. Then one of the men from the troop ahead stepped forward and interested himself as a team, a commander of the Dixon's Army Cavalry Division. Then Pat introduced himself and his platoon, and he was asked why they were there, Pat. Pat told him that they were looking for bandits' hideout when they rescued people from the Dixon's house, and that they were on their way to the family's house, so he would like to speak to their commander. Then they requested Pat to meet their lord as they showed gratitude because they found the missing individuals. All units marched into the mansion, thinking everyone should take a break. While leaving, they ate and were given gifts. Then their commander came to Pat to appreciate him again, and Pat thought he was doing so much as a nobleman. So he said they also thanked them for helping them complete their mission, and the commander said nothing was enough to thank him for finding his son babe, that he doesn't know if he can repay them enough, and he asked Pat if there was anything else he wants the Marquis family to do for them. But Pat said they did need anything. Then he wanted to bed as they had prepared beds for them too. Then the next morning they left. At the royal capital, Pat reported that eliminating the monster and bandits was accomplished. Still, he refused to talk about the rescue as he had promised Marquise to keep it a secret, and then the soldiers were given two days off for rest. The commander was happy that Pat's platoon was doing well and said it was because the crown prince didn't like escorts much. The cleaning had to be done to secure him. The Marquis family's oldest son got engaged days after the rescue, and the whole city was celebrating. But Wayne told Pat that the Empire's movement was suspicious, and that he had a hunch that war was coming. And at that moment, joy gradually began to fade. The Emperor's movement, Pat asked. The Emperor is a mighty empire to the west of their kingdom, and they are racial supremacists, as there's been a dispute with other neighboring countries over the mines near the border. Some people plan to attack and take over the mines, or defend the border with the Western and Marquis armies. There was a suggestion that the Western army was good, but the Marquis army had become weak because of their financial issues. A few days later, something there was a meeting taking place, and the leader was furious that the Western army, whom they wanted to also take sides with, was fighting on the border, and that it would take them some days to put up any force together. So a command was issued that the Western Army should be told to hold out. A thousand soldiers should be sent from the Southern Army to the Sabine Empire's border. After a few days, a report came that the Marquis' army attacked the Western Army from behind while fighting the Emperor's army, and there were a lot of casualties, and that the enemy had taken over the fortress. The survivors from there had joined the Southern Army. It was also said that Brigadier General Lanigan Beast killed, and he, as the Colonel of the Southern Army Command, he came to report the situation. Angered by the Marquis's army for working with the Empire's army, the Commandant suggested that the Royal Army be sent to destroy the traitors. Then Pat was summoned and briefed about the situation, but Pat said he came from the Rigsby family, and his family owned territory to the west, and they were close with the Marquis family. He seemed to think the matter must have concerned his father, and he had to think carefully, as taking the job meant he would be going against his own family, and he wouldn't betray his own kingdom, but what would the others say? Later that day, an executive meeting was called, and Pat was present. Then, the commander asked asked him if the Weston and the Rigsby relationship was strong enough to cover for each other, even if one was convicted of treason. Pat replied that he would explain his family situation. He said his mother passed, and his father and brother's wife were greedy, and the taxes from the territory weren't enough to sustain them, so they asked the Westons to help them with money. Since their debt was considerable, the Weston offered to lower the interest or even reduce the price. Pat insisted that he could never trust anyone willing to betray their nation for whatever they were offered. The commander then asked him why he distrusted his family so much, and concluded,
concluded that it was certain that Pat's family had done something that could be considered treason. The commander asked Pat if there was anything else. Pat then told him that there were other traitors too, like the viscous heater and baron, carry and baron ease, and he was questioned how he knew that, seeing he had cut ties with his family. He then said he still talked to his mother's family, so he heard it from them. Then the commandant said he understood the whole situation and would therefore put General Andretti to lead the army, and he had another mission for Pat, of which he asked what the mission was. Pat was seen running outside to call Wayne. He told Wayne that the marshal just issued him a proclamation, and that he should take care of his platoon for him, as he had no other choice. The marshal then asked Wayne if he meant King Pat told him he couldn't go into details and would be taking two men from his platoon with him, and he left hurriedly. The royal army was gathered and marching towards the west, and the journey was going smoothly as they were hoping to get to Weston territory the next day. However, they were ambushed, and a battle started. They had to break their carriages to use as a shield, and they attacked, and to the surprise, it was working well. They charged as they intended to get to them before they could use their arrows and even break into the fortress. Just then, the questions brought in more cavalry. The commander told his people to keep holding forth while fearing that their morale was getting weak. Suddenly, he asked them to look up and see the food depot of the enemy on fire, and the commander then told them that without food supply for the enemy, they win already. Surprised, Wayne wondered how that happened. Earlier that day, Pat was seen with his two soldiers in the bush, and he was asked what the plan was. He told them that they would infiltrate the enemy's base undetected and burn down their food deport. Pat told them to keep watch as he would break in, and they keep watch. But the soldiers had their reservation about him making it back. As Pat went in, he found the food depot, then set the shack containing the food on fire and left. Immediately, the depot caught fire, and they ran to shelters skater to find a way to extinguish it. Pat returned to his comrades and gave them two of the food depots on fire. Without food, the royal army had the upper hand as the Weston army was weakened already and started pursuing them. The Heaters, the Gary, and the Ages had fled to the West Fort. Meanwhile, the Rigby family heard the news and planned to run away, but the mother asked why they should run. They could just deny their involvement, but the father said it was late as they had an army with their family crest amongst the enemy's army, and their sons were there too. All they needed was for them to take food and money there. Then Pat went with the general to his family and saw his father running away in a carriage. He shot an arrow at the carriage, and as they intended to run, as it was only one arrow, Pat showed up and told them the horses were gone. Suddenly, they saw Pat. Pat confronted his father, and his father looked at him and asked him what he was doing there. Pat told his father that he was a second lieutenant of the army's kingdom, and his father was surprised and said there was no way he would have risen that fast in a short period. Infuriated, Pat said his father talked too much and cut off one of his fingers. As the mother went out to see what was happening, she immediately saw saw Patrick. Pat taunted her, and she asked how could a child of misfortune like him speak to her like that and that it was unforgivable. She told him she would let him go, but Pat reminded her that he was part of the royal army, and they were rebels, and said they couldn't get away with it. Just then, he stuck his spear into the old man's right, but the father began to apologize and begged for his life and swore that if he was the one who did, he should die. Pat asked him who killed his mother, and he told him it was Marinara, the woman with him in the carriage. He then kicked her out too and asked them why they sided with the rebels, and he told Pat that if they followed the Weston, their debts would be erased. He killed the old man and faced the woman as it was her turn next. Then he cut her loose as she had been tied before, and cut her heels as that was what she always does too, either beat people up or stone them in the face. She begged him to spare her, but he said she would not head to when he begged them, and she blurted out that his mother gave birth to him a cursed child and also deserved to die by poison. In anger, he killed her too and took their heads as proof. Then he said there was a lot of food in the carriage and that they should have lunch, but just then, they saw another carriage coming. From the incoming carriage, someone asked if that carriage was that of Baron Rigsby. The man was puzzled about why they stopped and asked his driver to stop by them. Then, when they stopped, he asked Pat what happened. Pat asked him if he was a Baron too, and he said he was Baron Curly, and asked if anything had happened to the Rigsbys. He then pulled out their heads and showed them to Curly, and said if that's so, he must also be destroyed, and he killed him and his family. Then, Pat and his soldiers moved to the Citadel and found the gate closed. The Citadel was made of walls, and the only way to do it was to pass through the front gate, as the back gate was locked and the front gate was weakly guarded, as it was where food transport was done, so they snuck into a carriage to go into the city. The guards asked the driver of the carriage for the contents. He said wheat, jerky, and salt, and they said there. Then they decided that they would check first for themselves, and the driver said yes, they should. Still, they didn't see Wayne and Pat as they were hiding behind a box of food, and safely, the carriage entered the citadel. Pat then said that he was going to be in charge of searching the food warehouse, and the others should make sure that the driver didn't snitch up on them. That was how they were able to set the food warehouse on fire. Back in Weston City, they still couldn't extinguish the fire, and questions were 
were asked about who had started it. Then Pat walked to open the front door, and he was appreciated for his work. Then, the royal army went in through the side door slowly and quietly as there was uproar, and the enemies were trying to stop the fire from spreading. Suddenly, one of them noticed a loud sound coming, and on checking, the royal army had snuck up on them. Then they had to fight and abandon the fire and fight, but they had no weapon on them, and they were massively slaughtered, but the empire's leader couldn't be found. It looked like they escaped long ago. They were discussing which other gates were available for them to run out through, and if there was one, they must have escaped before the warehouse caught on fire. The captain then ordered the cavalry search around the citadel as the empire's leader, the crown prince. Pat then thought that the prince might have returned to his country with food running low. Then he was called, and he said he would be scouting the surrounding forest area, and that the rest should return to the fort that connected the running dragon. The prince on the run was furious as he found no food in his village. He was told that if he ran for another half day, he would reach the next village, but he said they should go into the forest to find food. Hence, the prince suggested they camp at a certain spot that night, as it would take a long to reach the next village due to the bad road. Suddenly, they saw a rabbit, and they caught it and made a fire for the night. But unknown to them, Pat spotted them and identified the people there. It was ready to go catch them, and he decided to go in alone. Then, he snuck up on the crown prince and told the rest that if they did anything, he would kill the prince, and he would kill them too. The rebellion was quelled to avenge the invasion of the imperialist and the rebellious aristocracy. Unite the rope, a voice said, and the second agreed, and the commandant asked if those two were brothers, and affirmed then judgment was passed on them. The older brother was to be taken around the kingdoms and stunned, and then later beheaded, and the junior one was to be interrogated and then stoned. A few days later, the rioters were arrested and executed. The five rebels were officially defeated, and the third crown prince of the empire was handed over for money and imprisoned in the empire. An impregnable pact of five years was signed with the empire, and peace returned to the kingdoms. The war with the empire has been hard for everyone this time, and some people were awarded merits and promotions for their achievements. Among them were Wayne Kimball, who was promoted to lieutenant, and Patrick Rigsby, who was made Viscount Snake and captain of the mobile regiment No. 8 as a major. Patrick had contributed to overthrowing the Rigsby family, his own relatives who had betrayed the kingdom. The army structure is such that there are squads at the lowest level, containing a small number of soldiers. Then, groups of squads are managed by a platoon, and groups of platoons are formed into a company. A company consists of 100 people, and that is the basic structure of the army. The noble hierarchy is different. The royal family is at the top, followed by the dukes, the marquesses, and the earls, who are the upper-class nobles. Then, there are the lower-class nobles, consisting of the viscounts and the barons. The noble family is basically like that, and the descendants inherit the property and the title of their ancestors. After the award ceremony, a party was held for the lieutenants and the higher ranks. There, Patrick met a young and cute girl named Aisha, who was overjoyed to see him. She ran towards him with open arms, and he commented that she had grown up so fast. Patrick, also known as Pat by his close allies, was happy to see her too. Shortly after, two men approached Patrick and greeted him. They said that it had been a while since they had seen each other, and one of them complimented him on his strength. The party was attended by the noble families and the high-ranking military officers, and Patrick's mother's family, the Baron Canaan, was no exception. For Patrick, they were the only people he could call family, the Canaan family. One of the men, whose name was Decos, suggested that Patrick might want to come back to his family and consider managing the territory. Patrick replied with a half-smile, and Decos also smiled faintly. Patrick said that his suggestion might help him a lot, since he was suddenly having trouble as the breadwinner. Some people at the party were whispering about Major Snake, the son of Marquis Dixian, who had rebelled against the kingdom. After the party ended, there was a big upheaval in the military. Wayne had left Patrick's mobile regiment, No. 8, having transferred to the mobile regiment, No. 2, commanded by Vice Admiral Simon. He had done so because he was engaged to the daughter of a lieutenant general, whom he had met at the party. That was good for him, since unlike other regiments, their main task was to infiltrate and disturb the enemy from behind and assassinate their targets. Patrick was seen saying to himself that training was essential, and he told his subordinates that it was going to be a fun camping trip for all members of the mobile team 8. He said that all they had to do for training was to find him in the woods, and he asked his subordinates what they thought of his training plan. He continued addressing them, saying that until now, they had only been practicing their physical strength by running. He said that they had to get familiar with the mountainous terrain, and that if anyone found him, they would be rewarded. These words made his subordinates very excited, and they asked him if he was telling the truth. He replied yes, and the training started. All the soldiers under Patrick started looking for him, like a hide-and-seek game. 
Patrick decided to make the archery training more interesting by playing hide-and-seek with his soldiers in the forest. He climbed up a tree and found a huge egg that he thought belonged to a bird. He held the egg on his chest and patted it gently, wondering what kind of bird would hatch from it. Meanwhile, his soldiers searched for him all night, but they had no luck. They were exhausted and sleepy, but they knew they couldn't rest until they found him. One of them suggested eating hornworms to stay awake, but the others were not keen on the idea. The next morning, Patrick was still hiding on the tree, holding the egg with both hands. He felt the egg moving and saw a crack on the shell. To his surprise, a big snake emerged from the egg. Patrick was not afraid of the snake. He thought it was an adorable pet. He named it Snakey and fed it some mice that he caught. None of his soldiers managed to find him and claim the reward. They were starving and fainting, and some of them were on their knees. They wished they could have dinner, but they knew Patrick would not let them until they completed the training. Back at the barracks, Patrick was thinking if he should teach his soldiers the importance of training, since none of them could trace him or find him during the exercise. But then he realized that they had been up all night, and maybe it was not a good time to lecture them. He was interrupted by a guy who approached him from behind and shouted, Yo, Pat! to get his attention. The guy had long hair and a forced smile on his face. He asked Patrick if it was true that the mobile regiment Nowhere 8 trained in the forest all night. Patrick confirmed that it was true and asked the guy, who was Wayne, if he was trained by a lieutenant, as the rumor said. Wayne said that the rumor was correct and added that Team B was more than happy to join them. He asked Patrick if he knew what his team members called him. Patrick said that they called him Major, of course. Wayne told him that they only called him Major when he was with them, but behind his back, they called him the Death. Patrick was shocked and confused, but then he smiled and asked Wayne why they called him that. Wayne said that it was because his training was literally like hell. After the discussion, Patrick made both teams run like hell, saying that it was part of the training. His soldiers begged him to stop, saying that they were dying, but Patrick told them that they were not. He ran ahead of them, showing them how it was done. Team 2 ended up doing the same physical training as Team 8, and they also called Patrick Death. Patrick looked at his bracelet that he had just been awarded, saying that it was nothing to worry about, especially not the one that caught his attention. Patrick looked at the vast expanse of land that united the two halves of former Baron Rigsby and former Viscount Harder. He wondered what he should do and thought maybe he should ask his uncle for help. He then went to see his uncle and was greeted by a butler as soon as he arrived. Patrick apologized for bothering him and the butler welcomed him warmly. As they took him to meet his uncle, he asked if Butler Paul was still working and if he could handle the training. The butler assured him that he had nothing to worry about and that Paul had practiced with de Corson yesterday. When they reached the entrance of his uncle's chamber, his uncle stood up and shouted, inviting him in and calling him by his full name, Patrick Viscount Snake. Patrick replied that his uncle, whose name was Trolla, should just call him Patrick as he usually did instead of being formal with him. He continued, saying that he was glad that everyone looked so healthy, but he had come this time to discuss the management of the territory. His uncle responded, saying that as Patrick already knew, the Canaan family was surrounded by fertile farmland and that there was no shortage of talented people to work on them. Patrick then said that Paul's grandson would work for the snakes and wondered if he wanted to be a butler too. He also mentioned that the maid who used to live with his mother had come to see the maid manager and that some of the Canaan's people would also be transferred to the military territory. He added that Paul was still very flexible at his age, but not really agile enough and that he would have to practice a lot when he turned. This was the first mission of Team 8, and these were the commands. 1. To kill all bandits appearing in the Northern Army area. 2. To scout and manage the area along the way. And 3. To report any other incidents. He told his team members these commands and said to them that everyone must return safely. They acknowledged, and they all went to war. They engaged the enemy, and their enemy seemed really weak making Patrick wonder if the territory belonged to Major General New Garden. But after entering the territory, Patrick realized that it was not really exciting because there were not many people there either, or because the prices were so high there. There was no sign of any scouts, which looked strange, making Patrick wonder if they had all escaped. He hid the fact that a stampede had happened, because apparently the people in this territory were reluctant to pay for them, and they could not ask the army to prevent them because there was no way they could have deceived them. And after they returned to the capital to report for emergency about the stampede, the second team in the capital also came to reinforce, and the mission to rescue the New Garden family and kill the army of goblins was completed. But Major Patrick was still pulling Cyclops' intestine out, 
and no wonder he was called the Grim Reaper. At this point, blood was on Grim Reaper's hand and face. Patrick was then awarded by Viscount Earl, and Viscount's remaining territory was also under Patrick's control. And then, Earl Patrick Fongsnake was awarded for his successful mission with a bracelet that could not be removed. As the party went on, Patrick was bothered by the fact that the bracelet that he was awarded with was unremovable, and he then bumped into a young lady. He apologized if the lady was hurt, and said that he was glad that the lady was all right. He said that he would take his leave then, and he caught the lady's attention. Patrick returned to the army barracks and said to himself that it would not be nice if he still stayed in the barracks when becoming an earl because his territory was located too far from the capital, and so it was not convenient, and that there would be many other changes. Patrick was playing with his snake pet, which wrapped around him. He told it that it was growing really fast and called it P-Chan. Their fun was interrupted when a soldier barged into his room and saw him with the snake. The soldier freaked out and ran to the top officials in the barracks, saying that there was a snake in Patrick's room. They all looked shocked and demanded an explanation from Patrick. The soldier told Patrick that the barracks was a place where many people lived together and that he could not selfishly keep an animal like that. Patrick apologized and agreed with the soldier. He said he had to go to a lecture for over an hour and asked his seniors what he should do. They told him to move out immediately. Patrick became homeless with his snake pet and they wandered around looking for a place to stay for the night. They slept in a tent set up at the training area. The tent could barely fit Peach on, whose body was sticking out of it. Patrick decided to look for a real estate agent and met one who asked him if he wanted to find a place right away. He said he had the perfect place, although it was a bit small. Patrick took the offer and went to see the house. The house seemed big to Patrick, and when he entered, he thought to himself that the house was so cheap for only 100 gold coins, although it needed some maintenance. He let Peachon out and told it that from today, this would be their home. The snake curled around him with a gentle and understanding gaze. Hamira, a werewolf maid who works for the snake family, introduces herself to Patrick, the new owner of the mansion in the capital. She is 30 years old and used to work for Baron Curly, but she lost her job and her lover when the house was demolished. She is grateful to Patrick for hiring her and for his pet snake, Peachon, who ate all the rats in the house, she bids him farewell as he leaves the mansion. Pomera is amazed by the size of Pichon, who she thought would eat her when she first saw him outside the gate. She also likes the whiskey and Inesh that Patrick brought to the house, which are made by a witch and from grass, respectively. She does not drink wine anymore, as long as the alcohol tastes good. She starts to clean Patrick's room, being careful not to spill the seal on the table, which is a cross with two snakes around it. She wishes Patrick would hire more servants, as it is hard to clean the whole mansion by herself. She is delighted when Patrick tells her he has hired 20 more people, and she hopes to find her life partner among them. She meets the new servants, who are mostly werewolves like her, except for Aya, who is too obvious, and the goblin housekeeper, who came from Marquis Hickson. She introduces them to Pichan, who scares most of them. She tells them not to worry, as the mansion has huge tubs with hot water, invented and patented by Patrick. She also praises Patrick's talent for creating chess, a game derived from cards, and for making a learning environment for the children. One of the servants, who has elf ears, tells Patrick that the princess is the emissary of the devil, and Patrick asks what that means. Pamira walks by with a pile of folded towels, minding her own business. The servant explains that the emissary of the devil is someone who can use and communicate with monsters using magic, and also called a tamer. Patrick is intrigued by this information and wonders if it is possible to read minds as well. The princess, Sonaris, was talking with her father, the king, who was shouting, Snake! He pointed at someone wearing a snake bracelet and asked his daughter if she knew his name. She said no, and he told her that he was Count Patrick Fongsnake, a notorious rebel. Sonaris was intrigued by the name and ran out of the room, ignoring her father's warnings. She wanted to find out more about him by herself. She asked her maids to investigate Patrick and report back to her. They told her that he lived in a mansion with a snake as his pet, and that he didn't care much about his appearance or reputation. He also had a taste for young girls, but no special woman in his life. Sonaris was delighted by this news and decided that he was the one for her. She didn't mind his looks or his past, she only trusted her intuition. She ran out again, leaving her maids to wonder how she had grown up so fast and learned to sew her own clothes. One day, Patrick was summoned to the palace by the princess's request. He introduced himself as Patrick Fong Snake, and she introduced herself as Sonaris Meta. He asked her why she had chosen him, 
since he was not a prominent or handsome man. He was the third son of a rebel family, and he had killed his parents and siblings himself. She told him that she had first seen him at the celebration after the rebellion, and he had caught her attention among the crowd. He wondered how that was possible, since he was not attractive or remarkable in any way. She continued to tell him that she had bumped into him on purpose, but he had apologized first and treated her like a princess, even though he didn't know who she was. When he held her hand, she felt a strong emotion in her heart. She blushed as she spoke, and he realized that she had planned their encounter. He asked himself if that was not a blind kind of love. He snapped out of his thoughts and asked her if she knew about his weird personality and if she still wanted to marry him. She said that there were people like him everywhere and that she was not joking. She trusted her intuition and wanted to be with him. Patrick wished the princess would suddenly hate him and break off the engagement. He lowered his head as if he had received bad news and said he hoped the princess would help him in the future. The princess answered with excitement that could light up the whole room saying that she was a little princess, but she hoped he would help her. And so they parted, and the master's marriage was settled. Later, Patrick was summoned by one of the military officials for a mission. The official told him that a noble family had reported a production fraud in their territory, and that it would be lovely for Patrick to collect evidence. The official apologized because it was a secret operation, and said that if it were him, even the tax collector would benefit from him. Patrick said he understood. He left and arrived at a mansion, where he was supposed to carry out his mission. He thought to himself that instead of looking for evidence blindly, he would have to find another way soon. He heard some noise coming from a room in the mansion, asking if the person was still massaging it. The noise sounded like two lovers having some alone time. Patrick wondered what the master of the house was doing with some old lady alone. After he investigated the old lady named Rachel, whom he had seen in the house attending to the master privately, Patrick found out that the old lady did not have any lover. As he looked behind the locked door of the master's chamber, he saw two blurry images that looked like a heat vision of two people having intimate time with each other. He wondered what the images were and said that they looked like images from his past life. He said to himself that he could not possibly have this ability. He wondered if the ability came from the magic item on his hand, which was the snake bracelet. He concluded that the old lady had a lover and said that besides, there was another person, probably someone she joined to hide the fact. He realized that what the lady was having was an illicit affair. He went back to the military officer who had given him the mission and returned the evidence that he had gathered. The military official praised him and said the evidence he had brought was confidential. He asked Patrick where he got it, and he replied that it was in the kiln of the old woman's lover. The military official was shocked by this and said that he did not think that someone like her could have a lover. Patrick was getting bored, so he asked if he could go home now, saying that he was a bit tired mentally. The official dismissed him. One day, Lord Patrick came home with a weary look on his face. He said that work had been too hard for him, and he frowned as he entered his mansion. Patrick was always full of energy when he trained in the army, like a child, but he often returned exhausted from handling the affairs of his territory. Pomera smiled, thinking that he enjoyed himself more in the army. She greeted him and told him that Princess Sonaris had come to visit Pi Chun, his pet snake. Patrick was surprised, and his fatigue vanished. He went to welcome the princess, who apologized for bothering him. She remarked that the snake was very huge. The servants in the mansion bowed to pay their respects to the princess, while some of them wondered in their minds if it was normal for her to visit a snake. Pamira decided to relax in the big bath. Patrick asked the princess if he should restrain Pai Chun, and she said that it was his hobby to take care of the snake. He asked her if she liked embroidery, and she said yes. She said that she wanted to make clothes for him. He asked her if they would be costumes, and she said no. They would be everyday wear, but in military style or tuxedo. She also said that she wanted to make armor for his march. Patrick was shocked and asked her what march she was talking about. She said that she meant the march in April next year, and that she wanted to show off her homemade armor. Princess Sonaris told Patrick that she had been thinking a lot about the design of his armor. But before the march, she had to make him something for her brother William's wedding. She asked him not to worry about the deadlines, saying that she would get it done and deliver it to him in a month. She assured him that at her current pace, there was no issue with having it ready for the big wedding. Patrick thanked the princess and wondered if she ever slept. A month later, the wedding of Prince William and Elizabeth was held. They were a beautiful couple, meant for each other. If only every marriage was so well matched, it would be lovely and complete bliss. At the reception, one of the nobles approached Patrick and addressed him as Mr. Patrick. 
He said that the books Patrick had lent him were really helpful and that he would return them soon. Patrick said he was happy to hear that and told him not to rush the books. Another man came up to him and called him Count Snake. He said it had been too long and asked him why they didn't get a meal together. Patrick said he would love an invite. This man was his cousin, Dukos. Princess Sonaris walked up to him and complimented him on his clothes. She asked him who made them for him and said she would see him later. Patrick thanked her for making the clothes and said he would see her later too. The king addressed the whole guests and said he was grateful for everyone who had attended the marriage of his son William, the crown prince. He then announced the engagement of his third daughter, Sonaris. Patrick and Princess Sonaris were on the same stage with the king as he made the announcement. Patrick thought to himself that Sonaris must have known that the king would do this. He introduced himself to the crowd as Count Patrick of the newly formed Snake family and said he was honored to be engaged to Princess Sonaris. He had a dull expression on his face. Sonaris introduced herself with a bright expression that could light up the whole room. Her face was red as she said she was Sonaris and that she was happy to be engaged to the man of her dreams. The crowd murmured among themselves, wondering what was happening and what the hell was going on. One of them said he had heard that she was too young for this. Patrick thought to himself that now, new enemies would start to move as Sonaris was too young to be married. Her wedding date had been set for her 15th birthday, which was in about two years. Starting from the next day, the Snake House's servants were busy preparing for an engagement party. They decorated and tidied Patrick's mansion with lots of flowers and set tables and chairs for the guests to see on their arrival. After the setting up was done, they were all tired from the preparation. Patrick and one of the servants said that they had managed to pull this off. On the day of the engagement, the Snake Mansion in the Royal Capital was where the engagement party of Patrick and Princess Sonaris was held. Tables were organized around the compound for guests to chat, eat, and play chess. The engagement party ended without a hitch. During the engagement party, Princess Sonaris and Patrick held each other. Sonaris's face was all flustered and her cheeks were red. Patrick wondered if he really got to marry a girl as cute as this. Back in the palace, the officials were discussing the latest news. The northern tribe had attacked again as a unified force, and the country's northern army was holding them for now. One of the officials added that the northern tribe had brought 10,000 warriors, but the northern army had only 4,000. He said that the northern army badly needed help, and they had planned to send the third and eighth armies to assist them. Patrick, who was part of the discussion, replied, Yes, sir. As he left the meeting, he wondered if the invasion was planned to occur right after the prince's marriage. Some people in the shadows were also discussing the situation. They noticed that the kingdom's army was moving out, and this should drastically thin out the troops stationed in the royal capital. They did not want to rush, because that would be fatal for them. They said that they would only get one chance to correct things, and they had to be careful. Their leader folded his arms as he addressed the rest of his members with an evil, malicious grin. Patrick addressed his team members in the mountain region, north of the capital. He told them that their northern army was facing off against a gigantic army of tribesmen at the northern fortress, and that they, the 8th Army, had been chosen as one of the armies to reinforce their northern army. He said that they were going to sneak around and hit the tribal army from behind, and told his men to get ready. All his men replied okay. They entered into the battle as planned and defeated most of the northern tribe army, while capturing the rest of them for investigation. Their plan had worked, and the kingdom army had completely suppressed the tribal assault. Patrick was seen reporting to the king after they had reported back to the royal capital. He said that they were done processing the leaders they captured after their army began to rout. The major asked Patrick if the 8th army were able to extract any intelligence from the tribesmen they had managed to capture. Patrick replied yes, saying that the tribesmen confessed that the empire induced them to attack them, an attempt that was clearly meant to weaken them. The king asked, saying that trying such a cheap strategy, if it was meant to gauge their strength, or was it part of a long-term plan? Patrick answered, saying that the report said that the enemy aims were very simple and they could not find any sort of long-term thinking. He said that the enemies were hungry and they, on the other hand, had food. He said that perhaps they should cross-examine the prisoners properly. He also said that, by the way, he should visit Sonaris while he was in the palace saying that it sounded like Sonaris was in a bad mood, and maybe it was due to the fact that she missed him. As Patrick walked to her room and knocked on her door, he said to himself that because he had been busy fighting in the north, he had not been able to visit Sonaris for a while, and maybe she was mad at that. Then Patrick knocked on her door, saying hello. After she gave him permission to come in, he opened the door, saying that Sonaris 
he had made it back safe. Sonaris was so happy that he was back, and she said that she knew that he couldn't visit for a long time because he was busy fighting, but she was so happy to see him. She ran towards him, and Patrick replied, saying that he was sorry that it took so long to get back. Princess Sonaris pulled up a garment, saying that Patrick did not have to say sorry, and that she had made him a new military uniform for him to wear. With her face turning red and a big smile, she said that she wanted to see Patrick in it as soon as possible, and that he should be her model. Patrick was shocked and wowed by her devotion and dedication, and looked at her with his eyes wide open. She continued, saying that Patrick was called the Bloody Grim Reaper on the battlefield, and so she used red fabric for the lining of the coat, deep crimson. She also made embroidery all over in the shape of Paichan. Patrick said in his mind that he couldn't refuse, and he said to the princess that he was grateful and that he would put it on right away. The princess was happy that he did it. He left the palace and went back to his mansion. As soon as he entered, he saw some people at the entrance. He asked what happened, saying that Pichon had caught some strange food today. One of the servants said that it seemed like Pichon's food was an assassin who had entered the mansion, but was captured by Patrick's mansion. The snake had already half swallowed the assassin when Patrick gave the command. The snake spat out the half-digested assassin, who landed on the floor with a thud. Patrick was shocked that the assassin was still alive. He put one of his legs on the half-conscious assassin and said, Welcome to my snake house. He folded his arms with a devilish expression and apologized to the servant at the door for leaving them a messy room to clean. The servant said it was no problem and that he understood. Patrick wondered if the houses that disliked him had started to organize and come at him in a united front. He had already taken out eight houses. He thought to himself that until now, he had been fine dealing with their schemes. But now that he was officially engaged to Princess Sonaris, he was no longer a household of one. They would be bringing threats against her too. One of the military officials told him that while Patrick was away fighting in the north, some assassins had managed to sneak into the mansion. They were good, he said. Patrick asked what they knew. The man said that his house's intelligence department had discovered a credible threat against Patrick. It seemed like some of the same people wanted to go after Her Highness Sonaris as well. He handed Patrick a piece of paper and advised him to read the full report. It was worrying, he said. Patrick took the paper and said he recognized some of the names. They included Scott Paginu and others. The report had much better details than what he had gotten from the assassin he captured. He looked at the paper and noticed that some of the groups that were after him and Princess Sonaris were made up of anti-royalist nobles. Patrick read the report carefully, line after line, with his sharp eye, trying not to miss anything. Meanwhile, a group of people gathered in the shadows. They wondered where the assassin they had sent out to kill the snake upstart was. When was he supposed to strike? One of them said that perhaps the assassin was still planning the hit. It was fine to wait a little longer. He added that it would make sense to kidnap and kill Sonaris in front of him. Another one said there was no way they were killing her. Count Bush wanted her as his new slave. He sounded like he had all sorts of fun planned for her. Then Patrick suddenly entered, looking like he had found a bunch of rebels. His face was fierce, like a predator that had caught its prey. The people in the dark were terrified. He pounced on them, killing and torturing them to get answers. His method of punishment today involved loss of teeth. He told himself that he had gone with an unusual method of torture today. He did not do it for his enjoyment. It was nothing like that. He did it to protect. One of them called him a bloody reaper and told him to get on with it. He was just sad that he would not get to see the despair on his face. Patrick told himself that he had to head for the royal capital to root out any remaining rebels. He hoped Sonaris was safe. As the northern region rebelled at a well-timed moment, the royal capital's guards were greatly reduced. The 8th Army rushed back to the capital, only to find that a rebellion had also broken out there while they were away. The capital was in ruins, with some prominent buildings collapsed. Patrick looked around and noticed a militia soldier from one of the nobles who had been detained before they left the capital. He wondered how he had escaped and joined the rebellion, and he had a gut feeling that the second Prince Henry was somehow involved. He then gave an order to the 8th Army to stop the rebel soldiers rampaging in the capital and to move in groups. He warned them not to operate alone and told them to stay strong and not lose heart. He then ran to the royal castle, which was in complete chaos. He saw an injured servant leaning against the wall, bleeding badly and unable to move his hand. Patrick asked him where the royal family had gone, and the servant said he had heard that they had been taken away. Patrick ran through the castle, searching from room to room and shouting Sonaris' name. He was shocked and frustrated that he could not find her, and he tried to calm himself down by breathing deeply and using his reason. 
He thought that Prince Henry must have a command area set up in the castle, and that he was probably holding the other royal family members somewhere else in the castle. He continued to look from room to room, but more calmly this time. He hoped that his majesty was safe wherever he was. He wondered how many aristocrats were working with Henry, and he knew that there were always people who were dissatisfied with the ruler, but there were also plenty of nobles who were staunch supporters of the current king. He realized that if the second prince wanted to hold on to power, he would need to make the current king a puppet, at least until he could strengthen his faction. Otherwise, Henry would be deposed. Patrick kept reasoning as he entered an office that looked like a library filled with books. The books were scattered everywhere, and the office was a mess. He noticed a bloody fingerprint on the desk, and the blood looked pretty fresh, since the color had not changed yet. He concluded that this must have happened recently. He looked around the office carefully, trying to listen for any sound. He heard a faint noise coming from the locker in the office. He opened the locker and was shocked and relieved to see the king tied up with his hands and mouth bound with a scarf. He said to the king that he would set him free right now, and he did. The king tried to tell him about what had happened, saying that Patrick was involved in the rebellion. But Patrick interrupted his majesty, asking if it was being run by the second Prince Henry. The king was shocked, asking Patrick how he knew. Patrick answered that he ran into some soldiers on his way here, and he thought they were lying about the mastermind. He asked why the second prince would want to rebel, saying that if the castle had been ravaged to this degree, he had no further doubts. The castle parts had collapsed and shattered in a complete mess. He asked what the captain of the guard was doing, and the king replied that he had joined with Henry. Patrick said that he saw, and that was how they were able to keep the servants quiet. He asked the king what he wanted him to do about the whole situation. With one of his hands on his chest and slightly bowing, he said with a determined face that as for the rebelling second Prince Henry, he asked if he could purge him and his allies. The king replied with a worried face, saying that they could no longer quietly handle the second prince and that it had blown up too large. It pained him, but he gave Patrick the order to kill the second prince if he could not convince him to surrender. Looking down with shame and worry, the king said he was hurt. Patrick went back to his team members, saying that they should listen up. He addressed them as the Eighth Army, saying that they had direct orders from His Majesty himself. He said that they could purge the kingdom of all the rebelling traitors, who included the royal guards who had turned the castle into a field of chaos, and the rebel soldiers who walked around like they owned the place. He shouted that it was time for a hunt, with an expression that resembled a wild animal happy to go and hunt its prey. Sonaris was seen locked up in a cell, lying there helplessly. Henry came around the cell with one of his men, making Sonaris stand up. She shouted, asking him why he was doing all this, addressing him as Brother Henry. Henry told Sonaris not to worry, saying that he would not allow any harm to come to her. He guaranteed that, which shocked Sonaris. She opened her eyes and mouth in shock, wondering what was happening now. The other man with Henry asked if they could not just get some pleasure from Sonaris before she was sold. Henry turned around with a quick motion, drew his sword and plunged it in the man's neck with an angry face. He said that it was because of Cretans like him that this kingdom was doomed, calling him a vulgar swine. The man bled out and died. Henry said that he killed the man by stabbing his neck because he was a noble who abused his rank to pursue his personal desires and gain. He said that this country was rotten and never changed, treating commoners as mere pawns. He said that things had to change and that the noble class had to be eliminated since they only exploited commoners and confused political power with military power. He said that if only the country valued the well-being of the people and the military existed to protect them, things would be different. He said that the royals should not impose on the people and that they should take on all the responsibility and eliminate their extravagant lifestyle. He said that they should strive to protect the country and its people. Sonaris wondered what he was saying and looked confused. Henry continued and said that it was not possible because the royals and nobles were two sides of the same coin and that was why he needed Princess Sonaris to disappear. At this, she looked depressed and hopeless. Patrick swung in with great speed and thanked Henry for saying all that with a big punch to his stomach. Henry landed on his back and Patrick asked him how many ribs he broke, saying he must have broken quite a few. Henry held his stomach and tried to maintain his balance. He said to Patrick that he did not expect the captain of the 8th Regiment to come back early. Patrick kicked him to the ground and put his leg on his stomach. He said that it was quite obvious that Henry was intentionally trying to pull the army out of the capital and that his spy spoke up rather quickly. Henry looked shocked and said he saw. Patrick continued and said that he happened to hear all about his motives just now, and so there was no need to torture him, but he was trying to erase Sonaris, who was to become his wife. And for that, 
he would torture him. Sonaris looked shocked and felt loved as she watched Lord Patrick fight on her behalf. As Patrick tortured Henry, he asked him if he would beg for his life, saying that if he could not even protect himself, how was he going to protect the country? Patrick then killed Henry, and at this point, the king entered crying. Patrick asked the king why he was crying, since he already made up his mind and said this was how it ended. The king carried Henry's body in his hands and cried. He said that Henry would be buried secretly and that Patrick should tell no one about it. The king remembered the conversation he had with Henry a long time ago. He told Henry to assist William and Henry said that he went to observe the city. He asked his father what freedom was left for commoners and why only the nobles were rich. He asked his father what could be done about it and his father replied that there was something that only Henry could do. This caught Henry by surprise and he asked what it was. The king's mind was flooded with memories of his sweet Henry as he mourned his son. Patrick opened the prison door to free Cenaris and she ran towards him, saying that Lord Patrick was cool the way he fought and the way he used her name casually. She blushed as she made this statement. Since then, no one had seen the second Prince Henry in the capital. Two years passed and the day for Cenaris and Patrick's wedding was around the corner. Sonaris asked her maid what they thought of her wedding design, and they replied that it was great. With time, the people seemed to forget what had transpired, and they spent their days rebuilding. Sonaris was seen holding her wedding dress, saying it would be perfect for tomorrow. The next day came, and people greeted the couple with congratulations on their marriage. Patrick was dressed in a nice military uniform, with a star decorated on his chest. Sonaris was dressed in her beautiful wedding dress. When they got inside, Sonaris asked if Patrick liked her wedding dress. Patrick ran out of the room saying he was sorry, but he needed to do something now. Paichan was seen opening its mouth wide, ready to attack something.